Mm, hello. Today we are going to actually discuss James Joyce short story The Dead, which was published in the Dubliners. Now, um, I know this is something that is completely new for all of us. Something that's really difficult. Something that we are trying. So naturally there would be a few problems mm, i hope you will kindly bear with me for this lecture and let us see if we can actually improve as we as we move forward now the dead uh, we are not really going to look at aspects of james joy's short story the dead which are easily available online now what do i mean when i say easily available online now those aspects of the dead for instance the author bio the summary of the story these are things that are easily available even on Wikipedia and as they are easily available on Wikipedia I'm not really going to go into such details fine now one of, we are mainly going to look at the dead as part of 20th century British literature one of course secondly along with as a part of 20th century British literature I'm also going to look at aspects of James Joyce short story as it's a modern story, fine. But before we actually deal with either of these aspects, the first thing that I'm really interested in here is when is this story written? I'm not speaking about the period which is in the early 20th century in the 1910, 1914, uh, but I'm actually looking at this short story from the present point of view where this story was um, is set. It is set during Christmas vacation during the holiday season Though I said that I mean we are not going to detail summary basic basic a quick per, a per Understanding a quick summary of the story would be would be something like this It would be <laughs> It's something quite simple um, It's about Gabriel and his wife Greta who go to his aunt's place to attend a Christmas party. While there, Gabriel actually um, wants to make a speech, a speech in which uh, he wants to include a quotation from Robert Browning but wonders whether it would make any sense to the people who are gathered there. While at the party, Gabriel um, is confronted by a woman named Miss uh, Ivers who actually has a problem with Gabriel not really taking his Irish identity seriously. That becomes the, that, uh, the basis for the argument. Later, after the party in which most of them indulge themselves, whether it be in food, drink, music, dance, whatsoever, Gabriel and his wife return to the hotel. At the hotel, Gabriel suddenly realizes that his wife, Greta, had a had a past in which there was someone who had used to sing songs for her and who had passed away tragically. In other words, he realized about his wife's tragic love story. And Gabriel is then forced to actually rethink about his own perspective, about the way he actually views the world. And as he views the world from this new perspective, he, there is an epiphanic moment that he has and how he understands it. And that's when the story concludes. Now, this is a basic outline of the story. I'm sorry, after saying that I'm not really going into the summary of the story, I, I probably must again a pretty detailed summary of the story. <laughs> but what I intend to do with this is, what Joyce is doing with a story that is set in the Christmas season. Now, what is Joyce doing uh, in this Christmas season? One of the things that Joyce is coming up with is following a certain tradition of a Christmas ghost story in the dead now the question of course naturally that comes in everyone's mind is but where are the ghosts when you say christmas ghost story now and secondly why do they why do the english have this tradition of a ghost story during christmas one of course the answer for the second one first if we if if i may if i say that the English had a tradition of telling ghost stories during Christmas. Remember, we are speaking about a tradition which also speaks about camaraderie, sitting around a fire during the winter season, exchanging stories. That, in one sense, becomes a sense of cam uh, that 
creates a sense of camaraderie. And that's what these Christmas stories stand for, whether they are by Dickens, whether they are by Wilkie Collins, whether they are by Emma James or Sheridan Lee Fine or a series of writers mainly from the Victorian and Edwardian era. Now, um, <coughs> sorry, now, um, that is what your, um, your Christmas ghost story stood for. There is also a second thing. The ghosts also in one sense then reminded people of the supernatural of the world that's the other so that they realize that i mean it's not just the physical the corporeal that we are really associated with but there is also something that we term as that we term as the ethereal that's what these ghost stories would do in other words it would in in one sense remind people of the holy ghost in the trinity and in that sense, these ghost stories become extremely significant during Christmas. Now, that's one part of it. Now, given then the question then are, um, that we have, that we are left with is, how is James Joyce the Dead a Christmas ghost story? Nice question. Now, the James Joyce, when he actually comes up with, with the dead, the kind of ghost story that he is writing is something slightly different because he is also dealing with the past, just like all ghost stories are dealing with him. Now, what do I mean when I say he is dealing with the past? Dealing with the past in the sense there is the images of food that became a part of the, of James Joyce, the dead, where there are these descriptions of food that the guests are indulging in. The pyramids of food, the description actually goes in this manner that there are pyramids of food, there are chocolates that are wrapped in, there are these gold wrappers for chocolates and so on. This is in stark contrast to the past of Ireland, something that most readers, most Irish readers in, when Joyce came up with the story would, would have remembered. Because the past was not all that long back at that time. In the mid 19th century, Ireland suffered one of the worst famines ever known to mankind. Now, lots of people emigrated, lots of people passed away during this famine, the famine that's termed as the potato famine. Now, uh, when we were studying Huck Finn, for instance, we spoke about people who had migrated from Ireland to the New World, to America. And fear, of course, Finn become, being one of them, or Finn's ancestors being one of them. but. In the context of the story, one of the things that we need to remember is this potato famine, the question as to why it happened. Remember in the mid 19th century, Ireland was the bread basket of England. Now what do we mean by the bread basket? Not the roti basket that you get in restaurants, but rather a bread basket that when we actually are speaking about here is where most of this corn is grown. Most wheat grains are grown. So while Ireland was the place where most of these crops were cultivated, most corn was cultivated. This corn that was being cultivated was not something uh, that the Irish peasantry could enjoy because most of, our, if not all of Ireland, while it was under, um, while it was under British control after 1800, after the Union Act, also resulted in one other thing. Uh, also result in one other thing and what was this thing that we are speaking about it it result in this migrate um, this uh, these lands were controlled by the zamindars by the british zamindars the british landlords the feudal lords and these were absentee landlords so the corn while it was produced in ireland was hardly enjoyed by the irish peasantry irish peasant class and the irish peasant class on the other hand were forced to feed on potatoes so that during the industrial revolution during this time of industrialization that we speak of in 19th century england 19th century europe ireland when uh, there were people in Ireland who are basically um, feeding just on potatoes. Now, the second part of this, while they were eating these potatoes, these potatoes were infected by a fungus. And due to this infection, due to these uh, potatoes being corrupted, 
you're infected by fungus and eating this fungus you speak about people dying that's the kind of fear mind that joyce in one sense is reminding the readers of when he speaks about this this kind of world that um, the on in the in the party that the aunts actually come up with but far more significantly when we speak about this potato famine one of the questions that we need to rem- one of the aspects that we need to remember is this famine led to not just migration of irish from ireland not just the death of various irish ma- uh, peasantry class but also the rise of the irish nationalist movement now what do we mean by the irish nationalist movement the irish nationalist movement speaks about how ireland there was this desire for a separate state of course it was already present but it was heightened it was it got new impetus after this potato famine now the irish nationalist movement then by which miss ivers in one sense is referring to when she is speaking when she is conversing with um gabriel in, at the party uh, is is basically while it demands a separate state is also this demand for a separate state also had resulted in um a a celebration of irish identity and the irish culture two things that they were doing however the question that we have to ask ourselves is how does all this relate to what you term as a ghost story one joyce of course when he is speaking about this as a ghost story creates this ghost of the past that is the potato famine that's one part we'll get back to what this potato famine and the political significance of the potato famine in a minute but one the potato famine or the ghost of the past the second aspect of this are the gothic elements that are present in the story now what are the gothic elements that are present gothic elements as we all know is uh, is not necessarily about the supernatural but rather well they deal with the uh, god the medieval tries but here we are speaking about a sense of foreboding that comes through throughout the story this is highlighted by joyce in the story when he speaks about the kind of dark alleys the dark corridors the darkness from which gabriel enters the dark cabs and the dark hotel that he finally goes to all these there is this depiction of again and again of darkness not just symbolically as if of ignorance but also darkness which suggests gothic elements which make it a ghost story because again and again readers mainly the first time readers keep expecting something to pop out of the shadows in the story when they're reading the story one of the things that you are constantly you know, feel is that something is going to suddenly come out of the shadows and probably scare these um, um, people who had come to the party or even gabriel or the aunts or the hosts or whoever um, the aunts who are the hosts or whoever that is so of course joyce does not actually go to the extent where there are ghosts in the story but these gothic elements make it a ghost story or a, or a seemingly belonging to the christmas ghost story but going back to the point that we were discussing a bit earlier about what this potato of famine does now the potato of famine and the irish nationalism goes to the extent where gabriel first and foremost when he is having this conversation with miss ivers he speaks about the kind of world that they are a part of he has a problem with miss ivers calling him west britain she calls him again and again and she taunts him in a sense she calls him west britain west britain and there is a reason why she is doing this because the west britons were supportive of the empire in contrast to those who were asking for a separate state and she feels that gabriel who was actually working um, as a reviewer for the daily express who was a fan of robert browning for her he is someone who has completely become a part of the british empire or a supporter of the british empire rather than someone who has enough pride in his own national identity gabriel then comes up with the first one of the one of the uh, most crucial things in the story when 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 she taunts him she says i'm not really concerned about this because what is this island i don't really believe in it 
in this identity well this is said in a half this is a statement that Joyce seems to seriously think about because one of the things that he is doing here as the story progresses is Gabriel then coming up with an idea of what he means by Irish identity Gabriel in his speech where he feels that he is going to ask, answer Miss Ivers make her feel bad he comes up with a statement Joyce of course is being very cunning here very ironic because Miss Ivers is no longer a, um, <coughs> sorry, present at the party when um, Gabriel makes the speech but what he actually does uh, is that he comes uh, at the uh, at the present uh, the speech in the speech that he comes up with he speaks about Irish the chief characteristics of what is meant to be an Irish I mean the chief characteristics of being Irish that's the question that he tries to answer and he says that there is this hospitality that he found in the older Irish generation which he does not find in the hyper educated new generation and he says that this hospitality and he refers to the to his host the aunt's hospitality here and says this hospitality is what Irish is a chief characteristic of Ireland now that's pretty ironic and there's a reason why I say that it's pretty ironic because if the chief characteristic of Ireland the chief characteristic of Ireland is high hospitality they shouldn't really have a problem with their guests and in this case the guests then are not just the guests who had come to the aunt's party but rather the guests in the sense the English because they too would be guests of course you might argue with me saying that they were no longer guests they were basically colonizing them which is true but at the same time the hospitality that you speak about as being a chief characteristic of Ireland is something that is fraught with danger here if Ireland Irish themselves are immigrating or are leaving their own place or leaving their own homeland two questions that Joyce leaves the readers to question think about now he does not come up with a serious answer a straightforward answer to say saying that this is Irish identity and, or this is not Irish identity but this is a question that readers are forced to think about because there is a far more significant question that Joyce soon comes up with. One of the reasons why uh, we are not allowed to forget this particular issue in the story is in the conversation that Gabriel has with Miss Ivers again, which becomes um, almost like the backbone of the whole story. In the conversation, one of the things that uh, Gabriel says. Uh, and what Gabriel seems to think is literature and politics are not necessarily connected now this is a significant statement because how do we define literature or how do we define politics two definitions that we need to seriously think about now literature is generally defined as something which which is not written in vacuum we all know that there is a socio-political reason or a situation in which the stories are constructed literature is constructed that's how we understand it so the society has an impact on how people create literature now that's one part of it but while we say this that this is what literature means is this the same uh, is this what gabriel also means when he says that literature are not po and politics are not connected I'm not really sure that that's how Gabriel actually views it because here you also have to go all the way back to looking at how politics is defined now politics is generally uh, is originally rather defined as something as the city uh, as the study of the state as the study of what is happening in the state study of the city now if this is what your politics is or this is what politics is meant to be by the beginning of the 20th century itself politics um, has been corrupted to an essence the meaning the definition of politics has been corrupted to an essence where people no longer looked at it as a science as a scientific study of how things were happening in society but rather as how you manipulate people or politics as something that is associated with agenda or or worse even propaganda 
Now, if you say that the, if this is what politics means, and you are saying that literature and politics for Miss Ivers are associated for Miss Ivers in the first place, this association is not about politics as a science and literature, but politics as one with an agenda. She thinks that politics has an agenda and the Irish have an agenda that they have to go for a separate state and as they have to go for a separate state one of the things that they, that she is consciously um, vehement about is Gabriel not participating in this not being a participant in this freedom struggle because he is has in one sense distanced himself from it rather than actually support the Irish cause what in the 20th century uh, literature often we term as the troubles, the 20th century po political history we term as the troubles, where the Irish are fighting for their independence for a separate state. But this separate state that now Miss Ivers is speaking about and which she fears that those who are pursuing literature, those who are reviewing literature, those who are critics, those who are writers and those who are even reviewers or academicians or whoever they are who have anything to do with literature, those who are even writing for newspapers have to be extremely conscious of. This is Miss Ivers' understanding of the relationship between politics and literature. Just does not comment about it. He hardly comments about anything in the whole story. But while he doesn't comment about it, one of the things that he is doing here one, one thing that he very subtly brings to the fore in the story is when you are reading it, you look at this particular issue of what is happening here with with Miss Ivers' conversation with Gabriel is, are we supposed to side with Ivers? At that point of the story, quite often the reader thinks, yes, this is what we are supposed to do. This is what Irish identity is about. This is Irish nationalism and we are supposed to support it and Ivers is right. But there is a nagging doubt at the back of the reader's mind while he goes through these passages because Ivers does not come across as a moral center. She comes across as someone too petty, someone who is taunting him. Joyce, the style that Joyce uses here is by giving up, coming up with a small description here where suddenly Ivers rises on her toes and then she whispers to in his ear, West Britain. And when she says that, she comes across as a comedian and an irritating, pesky comedian at that. Not as someone who is, who is to be taken seriously. Joyce manages to, in, with that one, one single sentence that she comes up with, make her from being a, a nationalist, a freedom fighter, a national leader, whatever that she is, to someone who is irritating. Someone who is... Uh, is who who most of us are familiar with. Most of us have come across at various parties where there are these irritating gossips that you come across. And then you start wondering whether her problem with Gabriel is not so much because she is jealous of his achievements. Because she too probably wants to write. We don't know. Joyce again does not answer this question. But he makes us start wondering as to what is literature, what is politics, what is the relationship between literature and politics. Is it necessarily something that is symbiotic or is it a relationship where literature becomes a mouthpiece of polit political parties or politicians or po political agendas or is it politics that is being pushed through literature. These are the questions that we are, that we are being asked here. There's a lot of questions. Now, Moving ahead from this point, looking at what was happening with your, uh, with our understanding of Irish identity, by the end of the story, though uh, Joyce is not directly referring to the Irish question here, there is an answer that Joyce comes up with. Now, how does he do this? He does it through the process of what we might term as defamiliarization. Now, what is defamiliarization? Quite simple. It is basically making the familiar uncanny. The familiar unfamiliar, the familiar uncanny. That's what you do with defamiliar. Very simple, right? It doesn't make sense. Now, let us go back and look at what defamiliarization is. Quite often, mundane events, everyday events. In this story, for instance, the falling of snow is like, for instance, a party, just like in the story. 
is like carving what a goose turkey whatever carving some okay, a goose in the story these are mundane events that that happen as part of the of Joyce's death now the mundane everyday events are familiar we are so familiar with them that we hardly ever think of they are like the snow that falls on our shoulders that we brush off remember that's what gabriel does at the beginning of the of the story when he actually enters his aunt's house if there is snow on my shoulders and he just brushes it off just like you do probably with dandruff now when he <laughs> when he does this he goes further um, the story you know, what joyce does is how the snow then no longer remains as something that's familiar for Gabriel towards the end of the story. Let us look at this process. Now, if the familiar is mundane, or mundane events are familiar, rather, quite often they can be mistaken for something banal. Yes, mundane becomes banal. Now, what do we mean by banal? Banal is something where you are not really, no one is interested in is something almost so petty so trivial so um so meaningless that you are not really concerned about it now everyday events when they happen on a in such a manner that you are so used to them they tend to be meaningless now let us try to get a bit of context here we meet people on the roads every day. We do, right? On a daily basis. Now, when we meet people on a daily basis, we hardly pay any attention to the fact that we're meeting people on the on the roads, on the streets every day. You think of them probably as minor irritants sometimes. You are sometimes are pretty happy that you have met a friend on the road. But now, thanks to the kind of world that we are in, with lockdown all over the world, one of the things that we have noticed is this seemingly mundane event is not as banal, is not as meaningless as it used to be. Most of us miss going out on the roads and meeting people on the road, basking in the sun, speaking about the weather, saying, ah, today it is sunny, or oh, tomorrow it might rain. These are things that we no longer have been able to actually converse with, and we miss these conversations. Because even though we might phone each other, Call, call up each other, message, WhatsApp, mail, what, whatever. We can't really on a daily basis send a mail to a friend saying, do you think it's going to rain tomorrow? Because you don't really know how they're going to react. They may start thinking that you're mad. Whereas you do, do that on the roads on a daily basis so that what seemed like meaningless because it was familiar at one time is something that we're missing. It's not as banal as we thought earlier. In the same way, if this is what defamiliarization is in the real world, in the story, what happens with the snow at the end of it? But prior to that, for, for Gabriel, the defamiliarization starts with his wife. Gabriel thinks he knows his wife. Gabriel thinks that Greta is deeply in love with him because he's in love with her. It's obvious, right? Because he loves her naturally, she has to love him. That's how what Gabriel thinks. But far more significantly, he thinks that for him, uh, he knows everything about her. But after listening to a song, and after they go back to the hotel, one of the things that Gabriel realizes is that song has basically reminded Greta of a past that he knew nothing about. And the past is of a tragic love story. So that while Gabriel, when he goes back to the hotel and says, Ah, I'm ready to make love. Greta says, Greta is not really in a mood. She is basically weeping. She is sobbing for her dead lover. For her, it's not the lover that is dead, but rather Gabriel who is dead because he is not, she, is, she ignores him completely. This becomes an epiphanic moment for Gabriel. This becomes an epiphanic moment for Gabriel and that's what epiphany means. Epiphany means a sudden realization of the kind of world that you are in, a sudden realization of your position in the world as well as an understanding of what this world actually means. Two things that we are seeing here. Now, while Gabriel suddenly realizes his position in the world that, that his wife does not give a damn about him, that's one thing, wonderful. 
does not really care about him but the second thing far more significant is uh, he realizes that his the kind of world that he is in where he has been falling a prey to reading the world really superficially that's what gabriel suddenly realizes now what do we mean by reading the world superficially or understanding the world superficially just like when we spoke about an incident that is happening nowadays where you hardly go out and then you suddenly are struck by the fact as to how significant it is uh, meeting people on the road says just like that gabriel when he sees the snow falling from his window from his hotel window one of the things that he is struck by is this snow which at the beginning of the story was just a minor irritant and he could just brush off now represents various things one first thing of course what is snow let us ask ourselves a simple question snow is nothing but scientifically speaking frozen water which requires thaw but then the snow can for gabriel then stands for the things that are sim- stand for a symbolic understanding of the people around him who also need to thaw who also need to understand the world who need to actually unfreeze their minds so that they are no longer solidified in the way they are viewing the world but rather as looking at the world from a perspective which is far more fluid one but along with being far more fluid in the perceptions of the real world what they would also mean is this this fluidity or the way the perception of the world is is something which would result in a paradigm shift let us come to it in a, in a minute but when we say that there is this snow that he sees snow white in color shrouds death symbolic that's a simple connection that we have here but along with this this link between um snow and death it also speaks as we are just saying death of the mind death of thinking death of ideas death of being awake to the possibilities of the world in other words it might be where people are so fixed in their ideologies that they don't understand the world in the story for instance miss ivers who is supportive of the irish cause is completely blind to what is happening in ireland at the moment similarly gabriel who is a lover of robert browning's poetry is completely blind to what browning's poetry actually means browning's poetry where in the monologues and others that he comes up with as a has a major supporter of democracy of equality of people speaking of the right to speak for instance this is these are things that gabriel doesn't seem to be aware of when he is quoting from browning and thinking about browning he even does not realize about browning and his uh, and his issues with catholicism now while these are the things that um, <coughs> gabriel doesn't seem to be aware of in his in in the way he actually is coming up with a speech earlier miss ivers is unaware of what was happening in ireland even the aunt is unaware of what is happening she does not realize that not many people enjoy the music that she had come up with that she and her niece have come up with that is something that uh, gabriel notices and and a few of the persons who attend the party even actually silently disappear when this music is being played but the aunt is completely unaware of the changing taste this is the same music that they have been playing again and again and again there's something almost pathetic in the way they actually celebrate this party where they think that everyone is enjoying it and they are to a certain extent because they are indulging themselves but it's also a party which is not really original it's not really uh, a party in which people are experiencing something new it's just a tradition that they are following almost mindlessly in other words they have turned it into a mundane ritual a banal ritual remember this what joyce refers to right at the very beginning where he says gabriel came for the party again 
again becomes crucial. It's not like this is the first time that he's attending. He is attending again and again and again and probably speaking, coming up with speeches again and again and again as well. We don't know. In the story, Joy speaks of this, that he does come up with the speeches, but uh, whether it is the same speech, whether there are slight changes, or whether these changes make any difference, Joyce does not tell us. Now, when I speak of a paradigm shift that is happening at the end of the story when Gabriel has his epiphanic moment, what does a paradigm shift mean? A paradigm is a structure that we are looking at. Quite simply, if you are looking at a paradigm, it's a structure. Structure not in the sense that the table is a structure or or a building is a structure. A structure in the sense how you perceive the world. Everything becomes a construct or an ideology that the state has constructed, a world that you have, a way of viewing the world that you have. And now, if we are saying that this is what your structure is, this structure is something that from which we are moving here. It might be from the classical to the romantic, from the romantic to the modernist, or whatever that we are seeing here. In Joyce's story, this paradigm, in Joyce's story, the this paradigm that we look at, this paradigm that you are, that you are looking at is a move from um, what you might term as a classical orthodox structure to what might be a modernist structure. Now why do we call this a modernist structure? One reason why we are talking about this as a modernist structure from a classical structure, one if the classical structure is where the British were ruling over the Irish, the rebellious romantic structure would be the Irish fighting for their independence, struggling for independence. A shift from the perspective that Gabriel had, which was far more traditional and classical, to a structure where he suddenly realizes that he is alone in the world, that there is no one to empathize with, that there is no one to fraternize with, that he doesn't know his wife, that he doesn't know his aunt, that he doesn't know anyone in this world, that everyone is, is an island, everyone is isolated. This kind of realization that Gabriel has at the end of the story is basically speaking about a chief characteristic of modernism and the chief characteristic of modernism that we are speaking about here is isolation now while he, this is what your Gabriel is doing uh, speaking about this kind of isolation that he um, finds in the story that we find in the story this isolation there is another characteristic that we also find in the in this particular story which is also a modernist this is miscommunication or the lack of proper communication that is present in the story. Now what do we call as miscommunication? And why do we have miscommunication? We do have miscommunication because two persons are not able to empathize. Persons are not able to understand each other. Persons are not able to pursue the things in the same manner. Pers people are not able to fraternize. This results in lack of empathy and lack of communication. This miscommunication in the story happens at various points of time. Right at the very beginning when Gabriel is trying to have a conversation with Lily, the servant maid, when she actually gives her a tip, she thinks he's making a pass at her, which becomes um, one of the reasons why she actually refused to take the money, which also shows miscommunication. Later, Gabriel and Miss Ivers are hardly able to communicate with each other for quite some time. Gabriel and his wife hardly ever had a communication and that's why Gabriel never knew about his wife's love story. Finally, even um, when they're speaking about Goloshes, the aunts keep laughing without understanding what Gabriel and Greta, that is his wife, are basically speaking about. Again, miscommunication. There are multiple exam these are the multiple examples of miscommunication. Sometimes it's also miscommunication where people are cut off mid sentence. We have a Protestant who is speaking about his um, lawmaking process or or how attractive he is to the girls and no one is really interested in listening to him. We have one who is drunk, Freddie, 
who can hardly have a, have a conversation with anyone. We have people who act as if they are listening to music and clapping when they actually leave the room when the music is being played or rather performed. Now each of these are ways in which people have shown that they are not really a part of a fraternity that they can't really communicate with each other, fraternize with each other, that they can't empathize with each other. Again a characteristic of what we term as modernism. Now while this is a characteristic of modernism along with the other earlier characteristics that we do see of modernism that is isolation, both these characteristics that your that Joyce comes up with makes Joyce's readers, the readers of, of the dead, think about how they would view the world that they're a part of, not just Gabriel, but even they are forced to um, rethink the kind of perspectives they have. And while they're forced to rethink this kind of perspectives, one of the things that happens is they realize that there is a, they're forced to actually come up with a paradigm shift. Furthermore, let us move a bit further. If they are forced to think about their world, they are forced to also rethink what they had been thinking as the mundane or the banal for a long time. Like in our cases, we are thinking about meeting people on the streets. We are forced to rethink our perceptions regarding such a simple act. In the same way, other readers of Joyce is dead. See, we are speaking about it a hundred years later, after the publication of the story, and we are still speaking about his relevance. Now, Joyce's readers are then forced to confront this, their idea of the mundane, their idea of the banal, their idea of the familiar. And as they confront these ideas, these perceptions that they have of what they term as the familiar, mundane, banal, whatever, they might come up with a paradigm shift. It is not like they will come up with a paradigm shift, but they might come up with a paradigm shift. There's a choice that individuals have because then they are looking at the power of the individual. This is a story that speaks about how individualists, individuals are different or not necessarily a part of a structure. That their choices seemingly arbitrary for others also might make sense to them because they are based on sound logic only they understand at that particular time in other words a postmodern characteristic that you are seeing so the Joyce then becomes almost like a forerunner a precursor to postmodernism in that sense not that I mean we are saying that postmodernism or modernism comes with a time period but what we do mean here is that this perception that you have of the world that you are seeing here with Gabriel, with Joyce and with the other characters in the story and as readers ask ourselves once we have experienced the dead in the story suggests that there is uh, there are multiple possibilities of viewing a simple act which might seem mundane superficial. Fine? Now what happens if we don't realize that these acts which are seemingly mundane are not mundane or we don't question whatever is happening? For Joyce, we become the dead. Not the people who are dead or in their graves. We are not talking about ghosts here per se. But the dead, the title the dead comes from a reference to people who refuse to think who refuse to adapt, who refuse to actually face new challenges. Do you still think that this story is irrelevant now? In the present time? In the present context, this story becomes extremely relevant because that's what we are forced to do nowadays, adapt, rethink how we view the world. Right? Hmm. With that, we conclude this day's lecture. Let us see. Please come back with your questions, comments through WhatsApp or comments on YouTube, whichever way that you are comfortable with. Though I would prefer comments um, that you can actually email me the questions that you have. And we'll let us address these questions. 
Have a nice day.